Hello, everyone. Welcome to Achieving Success with Olivia Akin. I am your host, Olivia Akin. Each week, we will discuss the roadmap of achieving your personal and professional success. We give you real life stories on growing personally and professionally to achieve your life and career goals with the help of some top notch guests. Today, we are speaking with Brandon Hamilton. Brandon, who also goes by Blue, is a Grammy nominated 10 time platinum music producer and engineer. Brandon is also the founder and CEO of Nexus Strategies. Nexus Strategies is a business consulting firm helping provide business planning, financial solutions, marketing strategy, and general consulting services to help businesses become more successful. You can find Brandon on Instagram at Bassy Blue or by going to his website, nexusstrategies.biz. Hello, Brandon. It's fantastic having you on the show today. What's up? It's a pleasure to be here. To start off the show, can you tell me what success means and looks like to Brandon Blue Hamilton? What success means and looks like? Um... I think the best example or description of success I have is is the act of taking something that is in your mind, the way you imagine it, and being able to reproduce that note for note, beat for beat in the real world. To me, that's the that's success, right? Uh, that's that's mastering your own mind, your own body, your own physical skills to be able to produce what you your imagination into reality. And your creative side has really shown throughout your whole entire life. Um, You know, a lot of people say art and business, you really need to hone that creative side and be able to take what you have in your head and play it out. And like you had mentioned in those notes, especially on the music side of things. So how did you get into music, especially because you got into it at a very young age? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that journey? Oh, yeah, I was pretty much born into that one. You know, um, I started off singing. I was singing since I was about three or four, you know, like my church choir stuff. Then I um, started playing guitar. Um, after I first saw someone playing guitar, I thought it was a cool instrument. You know, I never really seen anything quite like it at that time. Um, I don't know. Music just kind of kept finding me everywhere I went, I guess, you know. <laughs> um, I was about nine years old. We would play, like, covers of, you know, Cool artists, maybe Nirvana, Cream, Green Day, Chili Peppers, uh, just some fun stuff. Um, that's really how I got started, you know, just uh, experience, man. exposure in general. Exposure is one of the coolest gifts you can give to a child, you know. So I was exposed to different arts and things, and I thought it was just cool. It's a cool way to express myself, you know. And, you know, I think one of the great things I like to talk about on the show as well is how sometimes we all get those setbacks, but it can end up elevating us and really projecting us to what we do long term and how we are. So at a young age, you know, like you had mentioned, you're singing, you're learning different instruments, but then your music journey kind of came to a halt for a little bit. So what made your journey come to a halt? And then how did you get through that and continue adapting and figuring out where in the music industry you wanted to be? I mean, there wasn't one halt. There were several, right? <laughs> you know, um, probably the first one was um, just not getting into the cause I want to get into. The way it happened just... You know, in my opinion, it was pretty unfair. You know, the the folks judging me, they we just had such a great time doing music that they forgot to score my uh, reading comprehension for music, my sight reading skills. And so it was a lot of back and forth with the school. You know, um, uh, I still had other full, full rides, you know, to other universities, but I only wanted to go to one place, right? That was one halt. I think another one was um, uh, just moving cities. I moved from St. Louis to Atlanta. Um, you know, I don't, th- I don't know. I, I don't look at uh, those things as as bad things, though. You know, mm-hmm. those are times to be creative. To I think in general, I think that anytime you experience something you don't like, right, that's gonna force you to never be in that position ever again. You're gonna work as hard as you can to never experience what you just did, right? Um, 
And so I kind of welcome those experiences to a degree. You know, they're not comfortable at all by any means, but it's a cool way to be able to um, reset, reorganize, recalibrate, and kind of learn what doesn't work and keep refining your path through, you know, through your career, through life. And you hit on something that I want to dive into a little deeper. You did not get into the school you wanted to due to, Mm -hmm. honestly, you being amazing, right? And how awesome you are. Everyone was in the moment and then, you know, they forgot, which happens, right? I get in the moment sometimes and I'm so in tune with what's going on that I'm like, oh, wait, there was this other task I had to be doing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now let me try to remember everything. But based on that and what you had experienced during that tryout to get into the university, you decided to not go to college. And I think that's important to highlight as well, because not everyone needs to go to college to hone their skills and go down their professional path. But you decided to take the skills you are already were perfecting and go right into working within the music industry as well as but as a producer. So what was it like making that transition from artist to producer and going right into the industry and, you know, really making the magic on a different level, but also being a young professional in that industry already having the experiences you've had? For sure. I think the first thing with college is that uh, when I was a, a freshman, in high school, I was already around all of the juniors and seniors, whether it was in football or music, uh, my jazz band. I was with the you know the folks that were at the top of what they were doing because from a young age, I was already, I just, when I see things, I understand how to process them, how they work. And then I can just kind of, you know, um, I like puzzles. I don't know. I, I put the puzzle pieces together and I can kind of like make a cool result, you know, make the result I want to see. But um, when it comes to college, when I was a freshman, I'd already done the math. You know, I was already a professional musician since 12 years old. And so I get to high school and, you know, by the time I start talking about college things, I'm looking at the math and I'm like, okay, well, if the possibilities of job opportunities looks the way it does, this is similar to things I've already been doing. Right. And so I'm like, why would I put myself 40, 60, 80, $90,000 in debt to do what I'm already doing, which is not making me hundred thousand dollars a year to cover this or fifty thousand whatever you know and so um uh, when you look at it college from just a strictly like investment standpoint financial standpoint most times it doesn't make sense and so what i tell people that um you know the young folks around my life i tell them like college is something that you do if it's in the way right anything that's in the way is in the way if i want to be a botanist college is in the way i want to be a nurse a doctor college is in the way right if i want to be a musician college is not in the way want to be a painter college is not in the way matter of fact going to some kind of organized schooling like that might negatively impact your creativity and artistry it might give you too many boxes to operate in right and so um that's the way i think of that you know and as far as that transition though it was there was some steps right so i didn't start off like from musician and artist to straight to producer it was when i went to la I was working with a record label and what I found out was all of the artists performed better when I was in the room, the way I would walk them through songs, talk to them, coach them, all these things. And uh, it wasn't until years later, I realized what I was doing was really uh, vocal production. Right. And, and that, that wasn't really a thing, even it wasn't recognized in the music industry like that until I think maybe 2010, 2012. So um, that's kind of what got me started. And even, When I moved to Atlanta, that's how I got my name established. I was a vocal producer for all these different artists and helping them hit notes that they didn't think they could hit. You know, um, one short story I'll tell you is there's an artist, um, we're in the studio, and uh, I was not vocal producing her project. I was there. I played guitar on it. And the producers were trying to get her to sing this note, and it's a really high note. And I heard her speak and laugh. And so I'm like, okay, I know that her body can produce this thing. I've heard it in other scenarios. And so, um, but she just couldn't sing it. And so I said, look, you know, I need you to uh, do about 50 jumping jacks real quick, right? And she was like, what? We're not to do anything? And, you know, I was trying to explain, you know, to 
her the the adrenaline that happens. This is what the reason why artists, you know, kind of sing and talk in a higher pitch when they're on stage, like adrenaline and um uh like when your blood pump is pumping faster, these things like constrict your throat, right? And um makes your voice higher, right? And so she didn't really believe it. I was like, yeah, just try. You're messing up now. It's just going to be another messed up take later if, if I'm wrong, right? <laughs> you know? And so she did it. First take. Killed it. You know? And so, like, that was, like, the first point where people were like, oh, okay, we got to just actually keep this dude in the studio. You know? <laughs> so for you, too, bringing that up and diving into that a little bit more, you were finding your path. And where you fit mm-hmm. within the industry, as you said, like that vocal producer helping artists get to that level, the sound of the music, all of that aspect, when it wasn't really recognized yet, it wasn't right. really a thing. So for you, how did you try to navigate your footing and make others understand what you were trying to do or how you kind of operated to get on some of these projects said you know grow your career as well because especially when any job or role or industry is growing right you look at supply chain a lot of people didn't understand supply chain until covid mm-hmm. hit and then people were like oh wait this is really important we got to dive oh, yeah. more into this um and beforehand they might have not taken the information you know as seriously or as important for you, how did you try to navigate that space and demonstrate, like, this is a thing. This is how it operates. Well, I think the first part of that is that, uh, you know, vocal production is not something I was trying to do ever, right? Even uh, music production was not something I was trying to do. You know, I got friends who they knew, like, I want to be a music producer. I'm going to go meet these people, whatever. I was never trying to do that. It was never intentional. You know, um, I think that there are two quotes that I've heard, like in the music industry, they'll tell you, uh, get in where you fit in. Right. And then in the business world, they'll say things more like, um, uh, you know, you've got to identify a problem in society and then present a solution you know, to be successful, whatever. And though both of those things are not super clear, they're not, they're not as uh, precise as they could be. You know what I mean? I think that what I look at, what I explain to others all the time is, you have to look at a situation and decide where you can prov- provide value to it, right? It's not about you specifically. It's about what you can bring to that situation. And so for me, it's easy to put my ego out the way and just say, okay, cool. Well, I am a guitarist. I'm a bassist. I'm a music producer. I'm an engineer. I'm a, a, a philosopher in my own mind. You know, I'm a, um, I'm a teacher, you know, I'm a, a consultant, I'm a, a helper, right? I'm, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not all of those things at once to every person, right? And so I think a lot of times when a person is trying to achieve success, they're thinking about themselves more than they're thinking about the world around them, you know? And so they, they, they people set out and like, like, I want to do this thing. I want to be known for this thing. I want to go do, be this particular person or whatever, instead of saying, hey, well, this person needs this from me. This situation needs this from me. Right. I've got so many friends, like even LeBron James, for example, is a, is a good example of somebody who he was talented in multiple sports. He could have been a lot of things. You know what I mean? He went where there was the greatest need for him at that time. You know, um, I think that's one of the things that if more people could figure that part out and kind of move their ego aside about how they see themselves and consider what type of value they can bring to a situation, that'll change everything. And I think that's such an important point as well is the aspects that you know we our egos all get in our own way sometimes and we have to take a step back when we start to see ourselves doing that and that is also based on understanding yourself and self-reflection right when are the moments when my ego is starting to get in the way what am i feeling leading up to that so i can mentally say hey let me take a step back let me get out of this headspace transition headspace but it's also how do you bring the solution where are you needed? And knowing that sure. if you can wear multiple hats, but what is the situation needing from you? You don't yeah. always have to wear every single hat like Blue does. Blue has a lot of different hats that he can wear. Um, 
but it's how can you put that hat on that's needed for that person and show up, whether it's professionally or personally, wearing the hat that that person needs from you in that moment in time. Yeah. So, Blue, that being said as well, you have worked directly with top artists in the industry, some of which include Justin Bieber, J-Lo, Jay-Z, Bruno Mars, One Direction, and I mean, the list could just keep going on and on if we're being fully tra transparent here, and I could go on for the whole show naming some of the amazing people you've worked with. What has that experience been like for you and what are things that looking back on working with those artists you were like oh I didn't realize this was happening in the moment but what a great lesson learned experience just the whole journey for you wow that's a such an interesting question for sure um that's a tough one um so everyone you mentioned it was all different capacities right uh, you know some of those I was a producer some of those I was guitar player, some of those I was a bassist and guitarist, some of those um, had nothing at all to do with music, you know, um, uh, it's pretty, you know, uh, the things that I've done are pretty diverse. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know, to me, I don't really look at none of those people or things are like, I don't know. They, that's a worldly thing of like defining like, you know, this person is this successful and this cool, as big as whatever. In a studio, in offices and meetings, like nobody's famous, you know? <laughs> and I love that point. I'm going to stop you and take yeah. a moment here because I think that is something we all need to remember too, mm -hmm. is that, you know, look at Mr. Mara who owns the New York football giants, right? Mm -hmm. He's this big name. He ha he can make a lot of impact to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And he has created such an amazing organization. But he is a person. You have to treat him as a person, be able to understand his decisions as a person. Not as a fan, not as, you know, understand that he is a person as well. Look at, like you said, these artists, they are people you know, just like us. And when you treat each other like a person, there's such a level of connectivity you can have and understanding of another human being while taking away the, I want to say it like this, the goggles, the fog yeah. goggles of yeah. holding them on a pedestal. Oh, I can't talk to them because they're on this pedestal. I have to treat them a certain way because I've put them in this pedestal. Society has put them mm. on this pedestal. But that can end up turning you into a yes person, into someone who doesn't feel like they can have a voice when, and they want that from you. They want that yeah. feedback, that conversation, that feeling like you do have a voice. And I think that's really important that you just brought up is at the end of the day, they all are people and how to work successfully with individuals, especially at that level, is you have to remember that you're all in the same space trying to meet a angle. Of course. Even for me, my issue personally wasn't putting anyone on a, anyone on a pedestal. But it, well, I guess not in a, as far as like their success per se, but my issue was kind of trusting that because they had had all the success that they knew what they were doing in, in all these different facets. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, that's not necessarily true. You know, most people that are highly successful, they're usually the most, the more successful I meet, the more successful people I meet, the more I see that that person is probably really good at like that one thing or maybe those three things, you know, and but those three things probably had a crap load of awesome results and things that came from them. Right. But, you know, a lot of folks don't really appreciate that. Uh, in the same way that an artist needs a team to be successful, well, an entrepreneur does too. You know, um, uh, the founder of a business does too. You need a whole squad. So you might be good at those two or three things. Like I'm, there's a company right now that I'm, I'm working with um, who I'm bringing in some pretty uh, massive collaborators. And and um, uh, I had to call their, uh, who was it, director of marketing. I said, hey, 
the CEO could be on the phone call, and the CEO founder is like he could be on the phone call and answer like detailed questions and mechanics, you know, this thing, but like uh somebody else has to be the, the mouthpiece, you know. <laughs> you know, and sometimes um that's one of those things where we assume that because a person's in a particular position that they're kind of good at everything that, that position that position requires. You know, and like I said, this particular guy is he don't, he's not a speaker. He's not a communicator. He's not a, you know, he's not a person of words, you know what I mean? But if you ask him some detailed questions about this software, all these things, like, my God, like, he'll just, you know, uh, I mean, it's amazing. He's an amazing person, you know. And I think that's really important to recognize as well. And Cardi B has even said it on massive platforms. And mm-hmm. she has said, you know, she wanted to be an artist. She did not go to school for business. And her one recommendation to anyone who goes to college is take one business degree. Because now looking back as this big um, music mogul business owner, she goes, I had to hire all these people and trust that they know what they're doing. You got to trust. I you didn't take the one class. I didn't take the moments to really understand what's going on. And now I have to entrust that in other people. And I think that's really important too, as you had mentioned earlier and tied that into, but also the size of entrepreneurship in business, in your community. It really doesn't matter if you're that famous artist um, that entrepreneur, you're a, you know, community leader, you have to understand that it takes a team because even if you've gotten to a point, that does not mean you're an expert in everything. Also, things change, they adapt. So even if you were at one point, as you have focused yourself on areas that you are passionate about, there are areas that have shifted and changed that you might not oh, even yeah. realize. Yes. Technology is changing. Laws change. Uh, territories change. All kinds of little tiny things change that could uh, impact your business, your career. Um, you know, I think, you know, material success is um, is similar to making money. Like, it might be difficult. There are some challenges to make some money, for sure. But it's a whole other game, a whole other set of situations to keep money. You know what I mean? Same thing with success. Like achieving it is one thing, maintaining it is a whole it requires a whole separate skill set, like an entirely different one. You know what I mean? And um, I think that's one of the things that uh, people don't really consider as well. You know, somebody can make a million dollars, but like maintaining a million. Again, like the skills that got you that million are not the same skills that are going to keep it, you know, um, especially with money. I think that's one of the things that people kind of I go back and forth with because I, I work with uh, a lot of financial services companies and um, with UBS in particular. And I was telling them on the education portion, I'm like, man, educating people on money, especially like, you know, athletes, entertainers is really good. But educating people on how to identify a person who is solid that they, they're working with is also important. You know what I mean? If I'm already really good at this one particular thing and I'm working my behind off at my sport or my whatever it is, I might not have the mental capacity or the time on my hands to go learn a new skill. You know what I mean? And so, um, but that being said, you know, when it comes to money, it's, um, I don't think, I think you know, as a society, there's two things we don't really explain to, uh, I guess, children, you know, here is that we don't explain what money is and how it works. And we don't explain what love is and how it works. And those are two things, two words that we toss around all the time, two concepts we use all the time, you know. And um, and it's the same thing. Falling in love is easy, but maintaining love is a whole different challenge. <laughs> right? So <laughs> I want to dive into that more because I love the fact you just brought that this whole topic up of achieving takes one skill set and maintaining takes a no a whole other oh, yeah. strategy mindset um drive you know and for you how has how do you go about maintaining your success and what you're doing and once you've hit that achieve level actually staying and maintaining it and what does that look like 
Well, for me specifically, I might be strange in that way. I think, you know, everybody has their own rhythm that they like to live life with. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. For me, I have, like, phases that I go through, you know? And so when I'm done, when I'm done, like, you know, there was uh, Blue, the guitar player. He's done. It's cool. It's been, it was a good time. It's fun. It was awesome. Can I still play guitar? Of course. Do I every now and then? For sure. But, like, as far as it being, like, a main thing that I'm doing or something that I'm really leaning on, I just go from, like, the next thing. I, I, I see something. I learn. I get interested. I want to do the next thing. And so um, that involves me always learning. And I love to learn, especially, you know, school, I think. School thing gives learning a bad rap. Learning is really fun. It's an awesome thing. You know what I mean? Um, it uh, makes you, it's, it's, it's fulfilling. It makes you feel good about yourself. You know, uh, school does it in a way that makes it a drag, you know, and uh, that, that's been a pet peeve of mine with school since I was uh, eight years old. I'm like, man, I love to learn. I got all these books, but like the way you guys do it is just, it, you drag out the parts that don't need to be dragged out, you know, whatever. And so, um, you know, being around certain people, I get to, you know, I'm always picking up different skill sets and I don't always realize it until I get in certain situations. And so I'll have friends uh, come along and, and um, tell me like, man. Yeah, uh, like one of my dudes came to me and was like, "Yo, you do this, you know all these people. You be, you move around like this, and you go to this place. It's like, well, that's valuable to this this thing, you know." Um, another friend came along later, and I'm you know doing the next thing. He's like, "Oh man, like you know, you know all these politicians, and you do all this stuff." And I was like, "I don't really think about like I know people. I don't really consider you know uh, what they're doing like that unless we're doing it together. You know what I mean?" So, um, um, I think. For me, part of how I move and maintain things is I need to maintain the first most important thing to me to maintain is um, I I don't want (laughs) to say this in a way way that gets misquoted, but like you have to maintain either your motivation or your discipline, right? Usually they both don't go together. You either motivate to do a thing or you have no discipline to where you keep going, right? You have to know yourself well enough to know. you know, how to maintain those two things. And so when I look at something I'm doing, when I get motivated behind a thing, I kind of build up systems around myself to maintain my discipline around it so I can stay active. And um, But yeah, when it comes to maintaining, it's just, I go, you know, I build a thing, put people in place to take that thing over, go to the next thing, right? Um, I'm always training somebody to do something, you know, um, because I don't, I don't know. Life is so big. I want to just go start to see the world and build things and do things and just be here while I'm here, you know? <laughs> well, and I think that's important, too, is understanding self-discipline, but also understanding, and I love that you brought this up, the fact that you have to train other people because it's going to get to a point that you cannot, even if you are when you're starting out, for example, in your own business of being able and having the time, the mental capability, all that stuff to handle all these branches of your business. As you start to grow, um, the business starts to mature, for example, your time has to be allocated differently. Um, Mm -hmm. You might not have the time to have your hand in all the branches full time, but you have to train people to know how to do those tasks the way you want them to deliver And then they can keep growing. They can take that branch Mm -hmm. and take it to the next level and all these things. So for you, how do you try to flourish other individuals to challenge themselves, to train them in the task as you start to do it and grow yourself? Well, my general business model, like on a personal level, is I look at a situation. I see all the flaws with it. And then I assemble a team of people who I know can address those different flaws. And so I look at, basically I I call it like I empower a a situation. And so um, when I'm doing that, sometimes it's not even training, right? Sometimes it's just like, yo, um, I'm just a conductor. Like you guys are going to play all these instruments and do your thing. You know, I want you to do what you're passionate about. You know, um, there are certain things that I don't do, don't want to do, don't feel like doing, et cetera, right? But the next person is probably really excited to do those things, you know? And so um, uh, on one end, there's people I'll train, like especially with music and producers, engineers, you know, um, I built them up and built their skill set up. And 
the toughest part about that to me is finding people who um, are genuinely dedicated to, you know, improving themselves, right? Most folks just want to win. They want to succeed. They want to make money, whatever it is. And I don't know. The fun is not just there. Like, okay, cool. Like, let's say you won. You made all the money, did all the things. Well, like, what are you going to do after that then if, if that's your only goal, mm-hmm. right? Um, the people that really change the world, they dig deeper into a thing. Man. You know, like, when you think about, uh, I can't name anybody. I mean, just Meryl Streep to Kobe Bryant to, you know, anybody. Like, when you when you understand a thing, you want to dig deeper into it and learn how to expand it. And, you know, you're like, you know, you'll uh, just better yourself inside of that thing. Um, and so finding people that are willing to do that is rare, actually, is what I'm seeing. You know, it's uh, most people are not built that way. I don't know if that's a thing of these particular times, you know what I mean? Because there's the internet kind of creates a, it's a farce. It, it creates this false idea of what's possible, what's available, how easily it's done. Um, you know, so I see people that are working, especially in entertainment when, it's, when it comes to sports and music. There are people that kind of like have this weird uh, system in their brain of like they can put in this little small amount of effort and have this massive success. And I'm like, yo, I know you saw that on the Internet for sure. I know you saw it, but I promise you, Beyonce did not wake up today. Like even right now for this last tour, like she was training 14 to 16, 18 hours a day for months. You know what I mean? Like. She didn't wake up and just was like, I'm going to go put this song out. I'm going to go, go, you know what I mean? Um, you don't really get to see the behind the scenes of everything. And I think that's part of, if I'm, you know, getting my soap out for two seconds, that's one of the issues with society over here in the States, especially, is that we only get to see the highlight reel of everything. We don't get to see it or understand or have any type of perspective for the work that goes behind it. And so now you got these older people who are, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40, that are judging all these kids for like being lazy and not having enough, you know, resolve to stick through things when all we showed them was the cool parts. We didn't show anybody the, the hard work, <laughs> you know? So yeah, they're going to feel like, oh, I can do the least to get the most. <laughs> well, and I think you touched on something I'm very passionate about too, because mm-hmm. you have to put in the work. And it, right yeah. now in our society as a whole, we're forgetting to show people the grit and the work that actually goes mm-hmm. in to what you're seeing, especially in social media. We forget a lot of times social media has not been something that has been around for, you know, a lot of decades. You know, I just saw a post that said if you were born prior, I think it was 1998, that you're mm-hmm. actually older than Google. <laughs> so think about that. I was born yeah. in 1994. So mm-hmm. I was still very young when Google came out, um, right? And it was more relevant. I can't remember a time without Google, but in reality, I'm older than Google. And yeah. your mindset is a little different at that point of like, oh, you can't just Google everything, you know? Even at that stage, Google was not what it is today. You know, we were taught you can't just rely on searching on something on the internet to get your answer. You have to have that backing. If you're having a conversation with an individual, and now you got me going into the rant. Um, but <laughs> if you're having conversation with someone, no matter the situation, you have to be able to back up what you're saying. Where's yeah. the information? Where are you getting this from? Because your voice, whether it's on a podcast like this or just with your family member or friend, that is knowledge you're sharing with someone. Mm-hmm. You cannot just put out into the space knowledge that isn't factual or doesn't have any backing to it because then you're sharing inaccurate information with others. Oh, so yeah. I want to ask you one last question mm-hmm. before we kind of pivot a little bit because you and I also had this conversation, pre- it, previous conversations, And I know we both have thoughts on this, but like you, I, you know, got into areas at a young age, um, environments that people looked at as I did not have the space yet due to my age and journey and 
path that I should be in that same environment with them. And I see that a lot, whether it's that 18 year old kid, that 30 year old kid that went from being an employee to now being a manager of a lot of people who've been in the industry or in that role for 20 years. And they're like, I was just your boss. Like we're not equals. Um, In reality, you are. So for you, as you grown and been in rooms with people who have taken different paths than you, um, especially at that younger age, what was that experience like? And how did you make it known? Like, I have a seat at this table. I have a voice. There's a reason I'm here. Man, that's a great question. I've never been asked that. That's, um, but it's definitely part of my story for sure, right? Um, I, you know, I've been a, I was a professional musician since 12. So when it comes to youth, uh, the only statement you can make to anybody older than you is being good at what you do. That's in my opinion. That's the, the strongest, boldest statement you can make is, all right, you can say what you want to say. I'm just going to sit here and be awesome. And, and that's going to direct the conversation. Right. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I think the. In general, you know, we've kind of delayed. Uh, I, I think we mistreat certain parts of our, I'm not childhood, but definitely adolescence, you know, which is, you know, fun fact, that's a recently made up thing. We just made it up over here in the States, right? It didn't exist before you know, so, so long ago. But um, when we look at all, so history is like my passion, right? That's my little side thing I just do in my own spare time. And when we look at all of these great characters and people throughout history, we look at, like, let's say Socrates and Plato and Da Vinci and Bach and Beethoven, all these people, they were the top of their um, career, you know, in the world at 16, 15. You know what I mean? Like, these were, we have these paintings of them when they got later in life, because when you got older, that's what you did. You, like, got memorialized and things like that. So in our minds, we equate their success with, oh, these, these folks were, like, 90 years old when they were being great. Nah. These, you know, these dudes were doing building the Sistine Chapel. You know, they were they were doing things at 19 years old. They had a whole crew, like, you know. And so, for me, being younger, I think the other valuable skill that I had that anyone older than me found interesting was I was willing to pay attention. You know, what I mean, most times when you, the younger you are, the less you listen. You're just like, oh, I want to do it. I'll do it. Let me do it. You know, you're not just sitting there understanding the story and the, the reason why behind anything. You know. For me, listening, I got to learn so many things. I mean, hearing, no school can really teach you a lot of what you would learn in, in, in the streets because a person's personal experience, you're going to see that on their face and hear it in their voice. You know what I mean? Um, so I got to learn what not to do and what you know how to navigate things. And I got to hear horror stories and not just hear the, the story, but just see the present impact of what they did five years ago and 10 years ago, you know? And, and when people would say like, man, if I knew now, you know, if I knew when I was 25 and I knew now, like I would have this, I would have done this. And I'm like, cool. I'm like 19. Tell me I was going to do that. <laughs> you know? And I think there's such a power in taking a step back and listening, because like you just touched upon, you can hear from other people's journeys, what they did, how it worked out for them. You might go, I really like parts A, C, Q of this story. But I'm going to take out all these other things. It doesn't fit with my alignment. Um, I want to switch it up and make B look like this instead. You know, Mm -hmm. and I think there's such power in knowing when to be the voice and when to be the ears. Yes. Oh, yes. I will, in general, you know, uh, paying attention in my mind, especially today's society is crazy. Paying attention is a superpower, you know, and that is in your uh, romantic relationships and your business relationships and learning and development, all kinds of things. Like if you can just manage to pay attention, you know, that one thing right there will separate you from so many people because ain't nobody paying attention for real. They're just doing stuff. You know, folks, most people that I come across, especially in music, you know, they just kind of everybody's focused on what they want to do. They're not paying attention to all these other movements and mechanisms. And so I'll come in and show people about things like um, 
uh, things that we would think are effective that are not. Even on social media, well, at Facebook alone, they got 2.8 billion bots they remove a year. You know what I mean? And they and um, the homie told me that's, that equates to about 41% of what's on there. And so you got another, you know, 3 billion uh, machines on there that are not human. So when you try to be organic and interact with things, like there's other parts of these mechanisms that we don't understand and don't know about. And so if we could pay attention to the movement of things around us and, you know, it'll help us to navigate to create more safety for us. You know, uh, it'll, you know, alleviate some of the risk we take with our um, uh, projects. You know, it's, um, I just, that's the, the most important, most beautiful thing a person could do, I think, outside of learning themselves is pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And, you know, I think, like you said, there's such a superpower in it because, where our time goes, um, how the mental space we have, right, to devote to something or the amount of distractions around us on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. It's like, where do you hold that time? You and I have definitely talked about it, uh, you know, honing that presence and being there while also as a busy entrepreneur going, how can I allocate my time effectively? What am I doing? You know, is this Pull that I'm on, am I 100% there versus, okay, if I'm taking the train, I could be on my way somewhere while answering the 100 text messages that I might have. Where does that align? I want to touch yeah. about something else you were doing. I, like I mentioned in the intro, you have your business, um, Nexus Solutions. You are still a producer. You are working on building up the Arena Football League again. Yeah. You have your hats in so many different areas. I want to first touch upon Nexus Solutions. So why did you mm -hmm. decide it was a good time and important to bring these services you've been offering to, mm -hmm. you know, the artists in your community to mm -hmm. business owners as well? Man, that's a great one. Um trying to decide the the origin of that. Um, part of it was my partner, uh, Marcus. So when, so I, you know, I usually travel the world, you know, I'm, I have a, probably an ADD lifestyle. You know what I mean? I just live in places for a year, two years or whatever, just go to the next spot. You know, um, I have my homes, but like, I'll just still be in a place like just doing stuff, working on stuff, whatever, just for a year. So, and, um, um, Marcus, we, we met back in 2018, and one day he asked me, like, yo, you're always doing all this stuff, you know, um, all these other places. Like, why don't you ever, like, invest time and energy in your hometown? And I was like, oh, people aren't, they're just, they're just not open like that. Like, St. Louis is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty big city, but, like, definitely small town mindsets. Like, you can kind of, like, almost physically see the oligarchies and kingdoms, you know what I mean? It's a really unique, weird place. And, um, um, but uh, he was like, well, let me show you. Like, it's not what you think. So he started showing me around and started, started meeting more people. And I'm like, oh, man. Well, I got to see, you know, in my travels and my, and my other business partners, I'm like, yo, I, I get to see some of the most elite companies and how they run from the inside out. You know, and so being around that so long, it wasn't a thing of uh, me having a study. It was just like, oh, I've only seen this done the right way. Like, why are y'all doing this this way? You know what I mean? I'm talking about from... Georgia Power to the Ballore Group uh, to um, UBS to I mean I just got to see so many industries that uh, uh, you know and got to see these folks who are like at the top of the top of this like murdering it you know and so when people are getting into different businesses it was easy to see the flaws and um, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs to me they're not different from music artists. They're, they're very much the same. They're like, I, I do this thing. I like this thing. I want to make this thing succeed. And that's kind of all they really focus on. Most times, that's all they know, right? And they, you know, end up building a team around to support that stuff. And so I'll come in and address things in different phases, right? Because what happens is, especially when it comes to uh, your pitch decks and things like this, well, what's attractive to an investor is not at all what's going to be attractive to your end user generally, right? And that's not really necessarily, those two things are not attractive to um, any um, 
uh, branding or marketing companies you're going to be working with, you know? And so I'm like, you got to have different materials and different information, you know, and different levels of access for people to succeed or whatever points you're at in your industry, you know? And for me, the biggest uh, kind of connection point is relating that person's product or business to whoever that person that they want to communicate it with, right? Like I said, sometimes that's an investor. Sometimes that's the end user. Sometimes it's the clients. And when I kept seeing so many flaws, it was just, I was like, okay, I got to do something about this, you know? Um, so um, probably one of the first companies we worked with was a pallet company where, I mean, you know, they were doing, you know, upwards of 10 million a year, but the profit margin was like 3%. And I'm like, bro, that's, that's not normal. You know, <laughs> like, you know, you got the crazy companies like Gucci or somebody where like, you know, I mean, their margins were like 1,700%, you know, crazy numbers, right? But like on a standard business, like about 30 is what you, you know, want to get, you know? Um, and so I'm just walking through, you know, this stuff. And again, I put together teams, right? Because again, I know myself. Again, I, my, I know my lifestyle, I know how I like to live. So I'm like, okay, cool. I can see this thing. I understand this thing. I'm not going to hold your hand through this whole thing, but I've got some of the most amazing people that will, right? And so I'll get you, you know, with, with bankers in your area. I'll get you with um, uh, the folks that can help uh, dress your business for investments or for your SBA loan or um, other folks that have raw materials that can support. Like I know so many people in so many different industries. And so I'll say, hey, I'm, again, I'm the conductor. Like, I'm not playing any of the instruments. I'm just bringing everybody in and saying, hey, here's a tempo, here's a time, here's a script. Like, this is what we're doing. You know? I love it. And I'd love to how you mentioned the fact that entrepreneurs align very similarly to artists, which is true. <laughs> and when you can connect both of them, especially coming from, you know, an industry like being a music producer, being an artist yourself, it brings a caliber of understanding how a lot of different pieces work. And then also seeing the business end of things and then seeing how working with different individuals in different environments, like you said, working with artists in business stuff, working with business professionals in business areas, bringing events, you know, all the hats you've worn led you to go, well, let me bring you those instruments you need to be able to conduct the business a high-performing way that brings you the most profit, that brings you the most goal-oriented that you want to be, that gives you the value to individuals the most. And I love how you've gone about doing that and how you're really taking the skills you've worn and things you've learned yourself over time and helping people in different areas. Like you said, all business types, all industries, you can see how it relates. And I think that's such a way that people forget about too, is it doesn't always matter about the industry. It's what are the skill sets needed? Where are the value added needed? And how that can relate. Blue, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you? Uh, usually Instagram is the best way. You know, it uh, depends on what they want to talk about, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, my email is always open. That's just blue at basicblue.com. Um, you know, I'm a pretty easy guy to reach, you know. Yeah. And my Instagram you, is basically. Let me tell you, Blue does not just say that. He really is. He's an amazing kind person. And I personally love all the discussions we have. And you know, if you're looking for that insight from Blue, whether it's on business, um, you know, he really hit his business partner and himself with Nexus Solutions is doing amazing things. He's doing amazing things with the Arena Football League that I cannot yeah. wait to see um, happen as someone who's worked in Arena Football myself. I'd love to see the league grow and come back at a whole new height. And so I'm excited to see Blue's journey through that, as well as him continuously being a producer, being a mentor within the arts and the music industry as well. Um, thank you, Blue, for all of your insight today. 
Thank you for having me. I appreciate the convo. A few of our key takeaways from today's conversation is the biggest gift you can give a child is exposure. Blue mentioned that in the beginning, but really it was a theme of this whole conversation, I think, because as you are a child and you get to understand the world around you, um, different skill sets, different opportunities that are out there, you really get that exposure. It can alter your mindset, and your journey and how you look at things and make yourself be able to put yourself in the mind of even no matter where I am in my journey in life, I can still keep exposing exposing yeah. my th- myself to different things. And I think that's really important too. You know, I've done Habitat for Humanity. I've gone over and done work oh, in yeah in Haiti, and people ask me like, "Why are you going to Haiti to do mission work?" And I said, "It isn't just about the mission work. It is about understanding their way of life." You know, how do they make their living? How are things we're doing in America, which let me tell you, there are that affect how they are living in their communities and how I can bring and share that knowledge going forward. So I definitely agree with Blue on this one. Exposure, no matter your age, is so important, as well as look at a situation and figure out how you can bring value to that situation. You can wear a lot of different hats and have a lot of different skill sets. But the most important thing is what can you bring to that person or that situation in that moment of time? They might not need you to wear all 20 hats that you can wear and perform well in. They might need that one skill set that no one else is bringing to the table. Or like Blue had mentioned with the jumping jacks earlier in talking, it might be that idea that no one is thinking of or challenging you in to just hey, it might work. And like Blue said, the way he mentioned it is, it might work. What do you have to lose? If it doesn't, we're going to be doing another round anyway. Um, As well as achieving success is one thing, but maintaining success is a whole nother game. I think it's so important to remember that once you hit the goal, it isn't, okay, I've, I've hit the goal. I'm done. I don't need to do anything else. It's okay. What do I have to do? to stay where I've spent my time, where I want to be. Now that I've gotten here, how do I want to stay in the space? What does that look like as well? This was a great episode with our top-notch guest, Brandon Blue Hamilton. Thank you for listening and have a successful day.